Genie Oil Investigation Part 6 After the New World Order finished collapsing the Soviet Union, they were left with virtually nobody to oppose them anymore. So between 1990 to 1991, I graduated high school in 91, they really started accelerating their plans for global domination. Back in the 50s, the British had taken control of all of the oil in the nation of Iran using an oil company called the Anglo-Persian Oil Company. APOC, which today goes by the name British Petroleum, or BP. The Iranian people elected a nationalist named Mohammad Mossadegh as their president, and Mossadegh kicked the British out of Iran, and he nationalized the oil business to share the wealth with the citizens of the country. And of course, this ticked the Western oil companies off a lot. So they sent in their attack dog, the CIA, went into clean house. So in 1953, the CIA overthrew the democratically elected government of Iran and installed a corrupt puppet leader who called himself the Shah of Iran, or the King of Iran. It's called Operation Ajax. So the Shah put the oil back into the hands of these Western oil companies. Naturally, the Iranian people, people weren't happy about that, but there wasn't really anything they could do about it. The CIA had ensured that the Shah would be kept in power by setting up an Iranian intelligence service, a secret police called Savak. And Savak was brutal. It had, at its height, about 60,000 agents who received their training from the Israeli Mossad. They kicked the Iranian people in the teeth. They just rounded up Iranian citizens for crimes as petty as possessing forbidden books. They would torture the people. They would lock them away in prison indefinitely for stupid crimes. You guys wonder why the Iranian people call America and Israel the great Satans? Well, read up on the CIA and uh, Mossad and what they did to the Iranians in the 50s. You'll understand what they're so upset about. Well... In time, the people did eventually revolt. They turned to the leadership of a Shiite cleric called Ayatollah Khomeini. And during the 70s, the people rose up and they drove out the Shah of Iran. And of course, they took control of their own oil fields back from the Western companies that had been exploiting them. The Iranian Revolution took place in 1979. The very next year, the United States prompted the... Uh, CIA asset Saddam Hussein to launch this brutal eight-year war against Iran. We gave him all kinds of chemical, biological weapons for Hussein to use against the Iranians. The war ended up in a stalemate in August of 88, left over a million Iranians dead, half a million Iraqis dead. But more than that, uh, it left Iraq deeply in debt, billions and billions of dollars to the Arab states, uh, Saudi Arabia, United Arab, uh, Arab Emirates, um, Kuwait. The problem here was that Kuwait was illegally drilling across the border into Iraq and stealing billions of barrels of oil through a technique called slant drilling. And beyond that, Kuwait had artificially suppressed the price of oil to $7 a barrel, which was making it impossible for Iraq to recover economically because that's the only resource they had to sell to make money. Though Kuwait was waging this all-out economic war against Hussein, and even with this huge oil glut going on, Kuwait petitioned OPEC to, to increase the output by another 50%. So when everything else failed to, in negotiations, Hussein contacted the United States for permission to go in with his military and stop Kuwait from stealing its oil. Hussein says that he got the green light from the USA through um, U.S. Ambassador April Glaspiero. Um, but what Hussein didn't know was that former CIA, CIA boss uh, and now president George H.W. Bush, he was looking for an excuse to go in and, and take the oil from Iraq since they didn't get it from Iran. So as Hussein later testified himself in court, um, he said that this was all a contrived war to keep the profits flowing to these oil companies. He literally said that uh, the New World Order, he used those words, the New World Order, was behind this scheme to double-cross Iraq and steal the oil since they hadn't been able to, um, you know, get, get into Iran. And that's not a conspiracy theory. If you go back and watch Bush's um, Address to the Nation, before Operation Desert Storm, he said in that speech that the situation could be used to usher in a new world order. So 
When Saddam entered Kuwait in August of 1990, it took him one hour to defeat the Kuwaiti resistance. And after that, the Saudis claimed that they were so afraid that Hussein was going to come on down to Riyadh and take over Saudi Arabia too. When Osama bin Laden learned that the Saudis were going to turn to the American military to come into Saudi Arabia to defend them, he said, no, 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 I've got thousands of Muslim fighters in this network. We can defeat those, you know, we, we can defeat them. We took care of the Soviet Union. Why can't we take care of Iraq? Um, in fact, there's a letter on record from Osama bin Laden to the Saudi Minister of the Interior offering to liberate Kuwait. And he met directly with King Fahd and um, Saudi Defense Minister Sultan, telling them that, you know, this is a mistake. Don't let the Americans in. But, of course, the offer was rejected. And almost immediately after that, in August of 90, the USA launched Operation Desert Shield and put 100,000 U.S. troops on the holy soil of Arabia. And this is where the propaganda comes in about how bin Laden and Al-Qaeda are big-time Muslims who always put their religious fever ahead of all other considerations. The argument was that the two most sacred sites in Islam are Mecca and Medina. And uh, here we've got the Saudi royal family inviting these infidels onto Muslim Holy Land, which was unthinkable from this fundamentalist perspective to have you know non-Muslims come in and defend the holy sites uh, when there were Al-Qaeda fighters ready to do it, come in from all over the Muslim world to put up the defense. So the story goes, bin Laden was so outraged that the Saudi government um, over this that he publicly denounced the regime. And the Saudis, who were notorious for chopping off people's heads, they gave bin Laden a slap on the wrist by ordering him under house arrest. And a year or two passes, bin Laden continues to speak out against the Saudis, so they banish him kick him out of Saudi Arabia. At least that's the official story. The true story is that bin Laden was still working with the CIA. Think about it. Here's this guy, bin Laden, a guy who commands enough fighters to think he can, you know, go up against the Iraqi military. But then you've got the Saudi government, which was afraid of Iraq, but they were not afraid of angering bin Laden by banishing him. The royal family wasn't worried for some reason that, you know, that this banishment might result in bin Laden ordering Al-Qaeda to go in and assassinate some of them. Why is that? Could it be that maybe the banishment was a cover story to explain why bin Laden was leaving the country to go set up operations in another country? Well, in the next video, we're going to talk about bin Laden's time in Sudan and his relationship with fellow CIA puppet uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri, who was allegedly responsible for masterminding the 9-11 attacks. See you then. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order can emerge, a new era, freer from the threat of terror, stronger in the pursuit of justice, and more secure in the quest for peace. An era in which the nations of the world, East and West, North and South, can prosper and live in harmony. A hundred generations have searched for this elusive path to peace, while a thousand wars raged across the span of human endeavor. And today that new world is struggling to be born. A world quite different from the one we've known. A world where the rule of law supplants the rule of the jungle. A world in which nations recognize the shared responsibility for freedom and justice. A world where the strong respect the rights of the weak. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause 
to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. Such is a world worthy of our struggle and worthy of our children's future. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. In the words of Winston Churchill, a world order in which the principles of justice and fair play protect the weak against the strong. A world where the United Nations, freed from Cold War stalemate, is poised to fulfill the historic vision of its founders.